This presentation is drawn from my ongoing research into the emergent interdisciplinary field of the aesthetics of law in the Philippines, a field that enlarges the understanding of the relationship between art and law beyond notions of censorship or copyright protection. I envision my study to be a primarily art historical intervention. To the degree that the discipline of art history is interested in the fluid, shifting context of art, it cannot be remiss in accounting for the force of law. It may be useful to point out that, given its concerns with the causal, evidentiary, and teleological links between space, time, artifact, activity, and agent, art history functions in a fashion not completely dissimilar to law. Despite the differences in purposes and procedures, at the heart of the relationship between art and law is the act of judgment, of which the granting of prizes is a particularly conspicuous, heavily consequential instance. In her introductory chapter to a digital compendium of laws and jurisprudence and culture in the arts that was published under the auspices of the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, or the NCCA, lawyer Rosalier El Barinaga asserts that although we seldom remember that we, in fact, live and breathe within a system of law, law, which presumably permeates from the collective aspirations of the people, is the expression of the highest and most important values of society, and therefore it is not only part of culture, but also the highest cultural expression that envisions to protect the existence of society and all its manifestations, in order that national identity can freely evolve. A series of assertions that would appear to be underpinned by the conceit that however prone to free evolution culture is, the law always already holds everything between its idiomatic long arms and a decisive, if often invisible, clinch, serving as both the condition and the limit of the very existence of culture, a product of, yet fully dominant over, the social world. Given the contents of her collection, Barinaga may be said to conceive of culture in a remarkably capacious manner, wielding the difficult polysemic term, which, as cultural studies scholar Raymond Williams has pointed out, has a complex and still active history in such a way that it resonates with each of the three broad categories of concurrent usage that Williams has identified. These being, first, the independent and abstract noun that refers to a general process of intellectual, spiritual, and aesthetic development. Second, the independent noun that used generally or specifically indicates a particular way of life, be it of a people, a period, a group, or humanity in general. And third, the independent and abstract noun that describes the works and practices of intellectual activity, especially artistic activity. It is how law reckons with this last concept of culture, which for heuristic purposes I will refer to as art, that is of particular interest in this study, and the claims made for law here are no less comprehensive, as the view of scholars John Henry Merriman and Albert E. Elson indicate. Law establishes the conditions of social peace and stability that liberate the artist to make art, and it protects the artist against repression or censorship on political, religious, or moral grounds. Law protects works of art against theft and destruction, and against adulteration and misrepresentation through fakes and forgeries. Through copyright and property law, the artist has enforceable rights in the work of art. Law makes possible the assembly and display of art collections and exhibitions, the formation and operation of public and private museums. It regulates traffic in art, providing an orderly process for the distribution and the redistribution of works of art. It defines and protects the interests of parties and transactions between artists, dealers, auction houses, collectors, and museums. It ensures the freedom of historians, experts, and critics to study art and to express their views. Without a legal system and the body of nascent law we call ethics, there could be nothing comparable to the sophistication, diversity, and prosperity that art and artists presently enjoy. Notwithstanding the ambition of law to accomplish a total and totalizing envelopment of art, it also maintains a posture of aesthetic neutrality. Professing lack of competence, law generally avers that it will not judge the worth or the quality of art, or indeed the limit what art is, a principle expressed in this pronouncement by U.S. Supreme Court Associate Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, which he made in the context of a 1903 copyright infringement case, Bleistein v. Donaldson Lithographing Company. It would be a dangerous undertaking for persons trained only in the law to constitute themselves as final judges of the worth of pictorial illustrations. At the one end, some works of genius would be sure to misapprehension. 
the very novelty would make them repulsive until the public had learned the new language in which their authors spoke. It may be doubted, for instance, whether the etchings of Goya or the paintings of Manet would have been sure protection when seen for the first time. Such a posture proves to be untenable upon close scrutiny, with law oscillating between certainty and uncertainty about how it wishes to deal with art, as, for example, in the arena of intellectual property. Section 172 of Republic Act No. 8293, the Intellectual Property Code of the Philippines, or the IPCP, provides that literary and artistic works defined as original intellectual creations in the literary and artistic domain, and collectively referred to as works, fall within the ambit of copyright protection by the sole fact of their creation, irrespective of their mode or form of expression, as well as of their content, quality, and purpose. Discernible here is the desire of the IPCP to protect art, some art, but there is a diffidence, if not a reluctance, in defining what works are worthy of protection, because the requirement of originality is a criterion on which the IPCP does not in any way elaborate. Two, there is little local jurisprudence to speak of, though a brief explanation in the 2005 decision Ching v. Salinas is given as follows. By originality is meant that the material was not copied and evidences at least minimal creativity, that it was independently created by the author, and that it possesses at least some minimal degree of creativity. Of course, this only gives rise to another problem because the use of minimal suggests that creativity and by extension originality is a separable component of a specific work that can be measured using an established calibrated scale. All that is now settled, according to lawyer J. Sid Fries Santiago, is that the originality threshold for the acquisition of copyright is low. Noteworthy as well is the outright refusal to decide on the matters of form or merit. Santiago puts it rather bluntly, aesthetics is not a factor in determining copyright. In spite of these, it should be clear that the very act of classifying, of setting up categories of works deemed deserving of protection, is an ideological, which is to say non-neutral, maneuver, one that law cannot avoid, though it may try to disclaim such by taking refuge in an appeal to the obviousness or naturalness of art as in collector etc. versus the Philippine International Fair, Inc. et al. The 1959 case dealt with the question of whether Republic Act No. 722, which exempts the holding of operas, concerts, recitals, dramas, painting and art exhibitions, flower shows, and literary, oratorical, or musical programs, except film exhibitions and radio or phonographic records thereof, from the payment of any national or municipal amusement tax, could be invoked in favor of the respondents, the Philippine International Fair, Inc., a company that had sponsored the Aquacade show, a water ballet performance. The petitioner, the collector of internal revenue, contended that ballet was not expressly enumerated in the statute as one of the presentations entitled to tax exemption. But the Supreme Court reminded the collector that it had already previously conceded that ballet is an art, leading to the inevitable conclusion that ballet performance is in fact included in the terms concert, opera, or recital, and therefore exempted from the payment of amusement tax. The law repeats the gesture of the disclaimer even in circumstances where it is compelled to advance more explicit distinctions between what art is and what it is not, as in the aforementioned Ching versus Salinas. One of the issues that the Supreme Court had to grapple with was whether two automobile parts could be copyrighted in view of the IPCP provision protecting original ornamental designs or models for articles of manufacture whether or not registrable as an industrial design, and other works of applied art. The court ruled that each of the parts in question was a useful article with no artistic design or value, as both parts were not ornamental, lacked the decorative quality or value that must characterize authentic works of applied art, and were not even artistic creations with incidental utilitarian functions or works incorporated in a useful article. Neither, therefore, could be granted copyright protection. The parameters of these statements have not been parsed, much less problematized, validating the observation that in the Philippines the nature of the judicial function is still widely understood in the following terms, that judging is law application and fact-finding, 
that law application is about interpretation, and that interpretation is a matter of applying the plain meaning of texts or reading the letter of the law, thus detaching judges from the active world of norm building and construing them as objective appliers who receive knowledge. It is also worth noting that agents of the law have made known their desire for law to emulate art. In his dissenting opinion in Laurel versus Misa, a 1946 decision upholding the constitutionality of Commonwealth Act No. 682, which laid down the guidelines for how to deal with those who had actively collaborated with the Japanese while the latter had occupied the country during most of World War II, Justice Gregorio Perfecto argues that jurists must strive to render judgments of enduring value in consideration of the unending caravans of generations to come. The inherent justice of their decisions, he says, must continue being sensed as a treasured human heritage long, long after they had rendered their inescapable tribute to death, proceeding to employ an extravagant series of similes with which to underscore his point. Like the beauty of the temples and palaces of Palmyra, which continues charming memory millenniums after they have become just dusty ruins, like the heavenly melodies which continue lingering in our ears long after we have heard those musical gems, such as the masterpieces of Bach and the symphonies of Beethoven, like light emitted by stars which ceased to exist centuries ago still traveling in the immensity of space to attract our admiration and arouse dreams of immortality. So that legal thought may be able to achieve its generic goal of arriving at a conclusion about the rights and duties of the persons or entities involved through a process of reasoning, it must begin with a factual situation, but it bears emphasizing that facts, in and of themselves, are never value-free. Arguably, therefore, the notions of art that inform the operations of the law are theoretical commitments, however unrecognized, misrecognized, or denied, in order to engulf art in what legal scholar Adam Geary has called its rage for order. Law necessarily proceeds from some kind of understanding of what art is, some kind of aesthetics that allows it to nominate, interpret, explain, evaluate, and situate art with, through, and against not only its immediate concerns as a form of social control, but also those of the larger world that it would circumscribe and subsume entire. It is in view of the foregoing that law deserves serious attention from students of art history who have long been called to go beyond the customary task of diachronically plotting from a variety of perspectives, such as that of the connoisseur, the iconographer, or the social historian. The presumably universal phenomenon of art that manifests itself in transient articulations and transformations over time and place. Rather, they are charged to apply themselves to this task, deciding the extent to which historical, cultural, and ideological accretions, ideas and beliefs about art, have been the causes of particular identifications of meanings in art, to distinguish, that is to say, between the mechanisms of production of particular interpretations and explanations, and the mechanisms of production of meaning in the works of art themselves.